Okay. Okay. So thank you. Thank you very much for the flattering introduction. And, and thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Yeah, I um, before I start, I would like to first thank the organizers in organizing this wonderful uh, uh, workshop on promoting clinical research. I also want to express my thanks to Dr. Subhashini Vasala Tantri and Dr. Chaturi Surabira uh, in accommodating to me to this academic program. Uh, I want to thank my younger sister, Dr. Padma Gunaratna, who is the current president of the SLMA, for inviting me to speak here today. So I would like to um, share my slides. And, and I hope, so, so can you see the slides? Yes, madam, yes. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so I want to thank my youngest sister, Dr. Padma Gunaratna, current president of the SLMA, for inviting me to speak here today. So I'm a professor of biostatistics in the Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University. And I have been working at Emory during the last 26 years. In addition to teaching, I also work with clinicians in writing research proposals for funding and designing studies and analyzing data. I want you to know it is 12.30, almost 12.45 a.m. in Atlanta, where I live, you know? So it is in the middle of the night and you must be wondering why I choose to talk to you at this hour. Who is in the right mind agreed to talk to an audience in the middle of the night, you know? So, well, I'll tell you why. My sister asked me two months ago about this invitation and I agreed, you know. And the reason is the, my mother gave me a very good advice. My mother was a very wise woman and she gave me an invaluable advice. Always listen to the youngest, you know. The youngest is to going to hang around throughout your life, you know, and you have to deal with it. So I listened to my mother. This is one of the reasons I am here at this hour, you know. So I, before proceeding, I also want to say I am very grateful for the excellent free education I received from Sri Lanka. I have been in this country 38 years, the 26 years at Emory University, and I received the highest quality education from the primary education from Dharmapala Vidyalaya and later from University of Colombo, for which I am eternally grateful. You know, this is, so I am very happy to be here in this training program in promoting clinical research. You know, before proceeding, I want to share one of my favorite quotes, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who was born and raised in Atlanta where I live and a civil rights leader. He said, Dr. King said, everybody can be great because anybody can serve. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and verb agree to serve. You only need a heart full of grace, a soul generated by love. Another person in the United States a late former President John F. Kennedy, at his inauguration for the presidential inauguration, he said, as not what your country can do for you, as what you can do for your country. So I want to say, I am very, very happy to be here. And, um, and I, I feel a very good fortunate to participate in this valuable conference in promoting clinical research. So let me start saying first, what is statistics? Here I have highlighted two words, evidence-based practice and then authority-based practice. And at, under this current situation in the pandemic, in the pandemic, these two words are very familiar to you, right? You, I'm sure you are well aware about 
the evidence-based practice versus the authority-based practice. And unfortunately, many countries, you know, have used authority-based practice, you know, at this urgent and timely needed, you know, actions. So evidence-based practice is a new watchword in every profession concerned with the treatment and prevention of disease and promoting health and well-being. So evidence practice has to do with gathering data and use this data to make clinical interpretations and implement interventions into the practice. So the essential skill required for the collection, analysis and evaluation data is statistics. So statistics is the science of assembling, interpreting numerical data and is the core science of evidence-based practice. So here you are today here and thinking, I didn't go to medical school to do math as a clinician. I would like to do a study, for example, to evaluate the effect of user, um, the use of oral contraception on the health outcomes among postmenopausal women. I know I am going to design the study and which kind of patients I need, but I do not know anything about statistics. So here I have highlighted two items. How many patients will I need? Which kind of statistics will be necessary? So I am going to give you an introduction to these two topics. I'm sure you heard this morning about will my study design allow me to specifically answer these questions? Oh, so at the end, can someone help me? Of course, there are well-trained people in statistics who could help you and they can do the sample calculations, they can help you to design the studies and analyze data. And will I have to pay? Of course, they are professionals, you have to pay. Sometimes use money, but not, not always necessarily money. You can establish collaborations, relationships, as for example, I am here today because of the relationship. So you could make collaborations. You heard this morning about content of a proper protocol. So before you start a study, you want to write a protocol. And the main components of a protocol are background and general aims, specific objectives, patient selection and evaluation. And if it is a trial design, of course, the randomization and blindness, you know, those will remove allocation biases. There are two components also that I have highlighted here required sample size of study and plans of and statistical analysis that I'm going to talk about today. But those components are very important in a protocol. The most important things, they need to be pre-specified. In the middle of a study, you cannot determine the sample size or what the plan for the statistical analysis. This needs to be predetermined when you write the protocol. Of course, patient consent, ethical considerations are very important in doing human research. This slide demonstrates the relevance of the sample size estimation. For example, let's say we are interested in a simple question such as what is the prevalence of COVID-19 among healthcare workers? So let's suppose that I test four people. I take four people and three of them are positive. So that means 75% prevalence. So I can construct a 95% confidence interval that is 30% and 100%. What does that mean? That means I am confident my true number that I don't know I don't know what my true number is. My estimate is 75%. It's likely to be 95% sure that it is between 30 to 100. So in other words, my error is 75 plus or minus 40. Like a, it is, so my error is somewhat close to approximately 40%. 
But let's suppose I test 20 people. And now, obviously, we are doing replications because we are replicating the study. And then we are not going to get the same answer. So 10, 10 was positive. So it is the 50% prevalence. So my confidence interval now is 40 to 60. So, and then the error is like 10%. So this example demonstrates my unknown prevalence is like here with 20 people, I can estimate much better, meaning my error is much smaller compared here with four people. So the larger the sample size, the estimate is more precise. The question is how much precision we need because we don't have a lot of resources we cannot collect large, large number of patients. And so the question is, depending on the precision we need, we can determine the sample size. Do I want to plus or minus 10, or do I need plus or minus 5%, or can I afford 20% error? So given the error, when you have a feeling about the error that you want to commit, we can calculate the sample size for the estimation problem like prevalence. So how many subjects? The answer is it depends. It depends in two important factors. One factor is the study design. Sample size depends on the study design and the types of the outcome. For example, like a, there are several designs of samplings and I, uh, you heard from previous speaker that the several different studies. So I'm going to briefly describe, very briefly describes sampling surveys and cross-sectional studies and longitudinal study. And the different types of outcome also is important. For example, if you are measuring something like dead or alive, or if you measure something like cured or not cured, present or not present, and it is a binary outcome. But if you are measuring something like systolic blood pressure, it is a continuous outcome, number of infected individual number means a count, and time to event is also frequently measured outcome, meaning mortality, time to cardiac events, and so that is also another type of outcome. In sample size calculations, binary outcome gives proportions. Those proportions usually if you are designing a study to detect differences in proportions, you need much larger sample size. But if you can work with continuous outcomes, so in that case, that you need a smaller sample size. So depending on the type of the outcome, your sample size varies. So let me talk about these survey samplings very briefly. And random sampling, what is random sampling? Random sampling means equal probability being selected. So if you are interested in a, uh, conducting a study at your own clinic in outpatients basis or something like that, in that case, you may consider taking a random sample. And you may define what type of disease population that you are interested in, depending on the disease population with the exclusion and inclusion criteria, you might design what kind of sample you want to take and you can take a random sample. But sometimes random sampling does not work. So those are the cases with like probability sampling, stratified sampling and cluster sampling. In the next few slides, I will give you an example of each of these cases. When we do, do probability sampling and stratified sampling and cluster sampling. The probability sampling is pretty difficult. The reason the probability sampling is difficult is that we have to know that the population structure, meaning we have to know sometimes census data meaning we have to know every member in the population, the chance or the probability that is being included. So it, this, is, this is one reason it is very difficult. So this paper I took from JAMA 
the, the, um, by Edmund et al. And this paper actually, the result of this paper is depression symptoms prevalent was more than threefold higher during the COVID-19 pandemic than before. And this study was carried out probability sampling. I mean, this is not surprising. People are isolated and, and the, the, the status of depression is very severe. So the objective of the study is to estimate the prevalence and, and the effect of risk factors on depressions and during COVID-19 and before COVID-19. So outcome is the depression, yes and no. So, so they did work with a sampling called like a well-being study and the study was conducted between March 31st, 2020 last year and April 13th. And the before COVID estimations were obtained by National Health and Nutritional Examination Survey from 2017 to 2018. This is a very quite famous survey that was conducted in 2017 to 2018. So this, this sample, the primary sample for the COVID was a nationally representative group based probability based panel, meaning the households, 97% of the households, we know in each household how many people live in that household. So we can calculate the probability a, a particular household is selected to the sample. You know? So once we know about the census data, we can create a probability sampling design. And, and, and this, this, this are in the United States, most of these things are done by the companies. You know? Stratified sampling. So one very good example for stratified sampling is who is going to win the next presidential election. We all love to know this, who is going to win the next presidential election, right? So, so in this case, we know in the population, the taking a random sample will not work. What is the reason a random sample will not work? Because when we take a random sample, we presumably assume that each subject's response is independent from one another, and at the same time, they are not correlated. But we know in a presidential election, certain race, certain ethnic groups would favor one candidate over the other. Like, for example, the, when Donald Trump in the United States, when he contested the very first time, fortunately, it was only one time. And when he contested, the Caucasian people was favoring him. On the other hand, for minority population like Blacks and Muslims, they were not voting for him. So the voting probability or the vote, the proportion of people voting in a certain ethnic group was different from one region to another. So taking a random sample and calculating a proportion will not work. So what you want to do is to identify the ethnic regions and sample, we take random samples within those regions and weight accordingly to the population and using a weighted estimator, we can get to the truth. So that's how we can construct a stratified sampling. So one example is what is the prevalence of kidney diseases in Sri Lanka? We already know in certain geographical regions in Sri Lanka, the prevalence of kidney diseases change. So, so in this case, obviously, we want to sample from different geographical regions in constructing the response rate. The cluster sampling, usually people do cluster sampling when the subjects are naturally clustered. And what we mean by naturally clustered? So in that case, meaning the outcomes are correlated within a cluster. Meaning if I know the outcome of a one person, I might be able to guess the outcome of the next person. So for example, let's suppose 
I am interested in the implementation of an intervention to reduce hospital infections. So in this case, we want to sample hospitals. So hospitals are sampled and randomized and the outcome patients are measured. But in this case, we really cannot randomize patients within a school, within a, within a hospital. The reason is the same doctors might be seeing the different people in the, in the intervention. Intervention arm patients and the control arm patients, they might contaminate the treatment effect through the physicians. So, Contamination effect can happen if the outcome, the, the, the subjects or patients are correlated with each other in a unit. So in this case, we do cluster sampling. Right now, I am working on a cluster sampling um, a study where hospitals are randomized. The actual dialysis clinics are randomized to a new intervention. And the intervention has to do with the willing live, willing uh, li writing the will of patients, you know, like the, um, writing the will of patients who are at the advanced stage, you know. So we randomize. We have we have like a five states in the United States. Within each states, we randomize certain dialysis clinics to the treatment, and then the certain dialysis clinics to the control. We are not randomizing patients, we are randomizing the whole clinic and, and then we are measuring the outcome of patients. So that is a cluster sampling. So this is a very brief description of the sampling procedures, like a random sampling, probability sampling. And as I said, these three sampling procedures, we, we do when the random sampling does not work. And I think I am going to very go very fast. You already heard cross-sectional study. And a cross-sectional study, actually, usually, um, we, we estimate things like prevalence of disease or identify association between certain variables. If we want to identify uh, or measure the association between certain variables, we do a cross-sectional study. Cross-sectional studies are simple to do, and it just show what population looks like at a point of time. The major disadvantage of the cross-sectional study is the confounding, meaning you may be looking at a relationship between two variables, and another third variable might be responsible for that relationship. For example, you may be studying cholesterol and the heart attack relationship, but at the same time, we know that relationship can be influenced by body weight, for example, BMI. So teasing out those relationships is quite difficult in a cross-sectional study. Longitudinal studies means we take the baseline measurements and then we follow patients and then we take outcomes, measurements over time. And the these are difficult studies. It takes longer time and they are expensive. And of course, if there are dropouts, then we have to deal with the dropouts in the analysis. And that is not an easy problem. And because dropout can occur for many, many, many reasons. The main advantage of the longitudinal study is you can compare the patient's post values to the pre-values baseline values, and then you can look at the how much change happened within the same person. So that is the main advantage of the longitudinal study. And that actually helps us to control the bias against confounding variables. So let me get back, let me get to the sample size calculations. And sample size calculations play an important role in clinical research. The size of the study should be considered early in the planning phase. The purpose is to select a sample size such that selected sample size will achieve a desired power and a pre-specified meaningful difference given level of significance. Here I have highlighted three words. 
So those are the words, those are the things, values we need to know calculating the sample size. So I have taken the sample size calculation paragraph from the New England Journal of Medicine article. And here it says a cure rate of 90% of this type of infusion versus 60% of antibiotic therapy is assumed. Meaning we assume these two numbers or we expect these two numbers and then we calculate per group 38% so needed to achieve 80% power and with the significance level 0.22%. So to account for dropouts, we plan 40 patients because we need 38. So we make an accommodation for two people to drop out because it is going to happen, okay? And usually sample calculations are done only for primary outcomes. So one important thing is the sample size calculation relates to hypothesis testing. And so what are the common scientific questions that raise scientific hypothesis? Is the new treatment effective in reducing blood pressure? So for this type of question, you might choose to study two groups and one group is getting the new treatment, the other group getting the standard treatment, and you have a hypothesis testing problem. Is the presence of major depression higher among subjects, the COVID before COVID, the people who had COVID and people who didn't have COVID? Again, you are comparing proportions of depression between those two groups. And then is cholesterol associated with the incidence of cardiac events? or the new rehabilitation educational program working better than the previous symptoms of health outcome. Again, you are comparing two groups of patients who receive educational program and who did not receive it. So hypothesis testing problem is easiest way to remember the hypothesis testing problem is thinking about a jury trial. So in a jury trial, what, we, what would they do? Usually you have, a, the, the, you have a prosecution, they bring the trial. And in this case, it's like a researcher. So in the jury trial, murder trial, you presume is innocent. Meaning jury is instructed to consider the person is as innocent until see, they see the evidence. So that is exactly the same case as null hypothesis, contradiction of research hypothesis. Meaning if, the, if we are talking about two groups, new treatment versus the old treatment, what our null hypothesis is, the means of the blood pressure in the both treatments are the same. Meaning contradiction of researchers theory. In a jury trial, we get evidence. We have to collect good evidence. Similarly, we have to collect good data. And this is the most important thing, jury deciding the verdict. And, and that is a statistical test here, meaning we summarize the data, we calculate the statistical test and jury deciding the verdict, meaning jury look at the data and compare to the reasonable doubt, okay? So in this case, we calculate something called p-value. We calculate the p-value and and compared to type one error. And so what is the, the p-value? That is very much like you can think of as a jury trial. What do we do in a jury trial? In a jury trial, we look at the evidence thinking that the person is innocent, okay? Like for example, having a bloody knife or having blood in the murderer's clothes. What is the probability of seeing something like that if the person is innocent? That is the p-value. The p-value is what is the probability of observing something like this as extreme as this if the null hypothesis is true? Very much like a jury trial. If the, if the seeing a bloody knife, seeing a blood in the world, if that probability is very small, very, very small, we reject the null hypothesis. Same thing here. So we calculate p-value compared to the type one error. And if it is very small, we reject the null hypothesis and conclude that the null hypothesis is not true. 
power of the trial. Of course, the power we know in order to get a fair trial, we have to have the people who know the law, who know the, the, the good lawyers, right? So we have to make sure, and we have to measure good evidence. We have to use the correct lab method. So power of the trial, we have to increase the power of the trial. Similarly here, one of the major things about the power of the trial is the number of subjects. So in order to get reasonable power, we have to have enough subjects. So usually we recommend 80% power and then 80% power, and then we need to know the number of subjects. Okay, so this, this, this slide is for your information. You can read it later. And this is the null hypothesis mean being the same and not being the same. This is the test, uh, test statistic and calculate the p-value and then the rejection. If you are comparing proportions, you know, and the we set up the hypothesis p1 equals p2 and p1 not equal to p2. And I already spoke about the p-value. P-value is the probability of observing evidence as extreme as this when the null hypothesis is true. And then like a jury trial, and then if the P-value is very low compared to 0.05, we reject the null hypothesis. If the study does not have adequate power, then P-value is large, which conclude no concluding no difference, which may not be true. So, so this is the problem. If you, if you do a study without planning, without calculating sample size, without recognizing whether you have power or not, and your sample size may be small and you might not reject the null hypothesis, and then you may say there is no difference, but that is due to the smaller sample size, not to the truth. So this is the reason that the planning phase it is important to calculate. So like a jury trial, when we analyze data, we make two types of errors, okay? We all know in a jury trial, not every murderers get convicted, right? It's not always innocent people go home. Innocent people also go to jail. The same thing with statistics. And this side hypothesis testing conclusion and this side the true situation. We call it type one error, type two error. Meaning we conclude difference exists, but there is no difference. And type two error is we don't reject the null hypothesis and we conclude in this case, no difference, but a difference exists. One minus type two error is the power. And that is what we usually set it up for 80%, okay? And the next few slides, I'm going to walk through very quickly, but I will tell you what is needed for each outcome. I already said the design is important, type of outcome important. So I'm going to walk through like a, for a continuous what you need, for a binary what you need to calculate sample size. So this is an example. And in this example, I'm asking the questions, is the presence of major depression higher among subjects who had COVID compared to the people who didn't have COVID? And so my outcome is presence of depression that is binary. So I'm comparing two groups. So what I need, remember the previous example I talk about here? So I'm comparing two groups in this case. So what do I need? I need to, to calculate the power I need following. I need the expected proportion between two groups. So I have to hypothesize. How do I hypothesize? You can use your medical wisdom. You, you already know the, in general how much how many people have had depression, have depression um, in general population. So then you can expect with the COVID, the depression is going to be higher. So you can get those two numbers you can expected values, and then we fix this value, power is 80% usual sample size. If you want to look at a smaller difference, you need a larger sample size. If the difference is very, very large, smaller sample size. This is very intuitive, right? If, we, if the difference is very, very large between two samples, true difference, you really don't need much statistics. 
I have put a website here. You can go to this website to calculate sample size. In this website, you can go and calculate. For example, I have given an example. You can go to that website and calculate. And for example, in this case, like, a, okay, we want to know what is the effect of lockdown from COVID. So I can say we expect 30% of the people to be positive before lockdown and 10% after lockdown. So I give these expected two numbers and the significance level is 0.05, 80% power. I can calculate 62 subjects per group to determine a difference of 20%, met meaning 30 versus 10. If I make this difference 25%, I need only 35 subjects because now I am looking at a much larger difference. So I can calculate that number for proportions in a very simple manner. Okay, so now I'm going to move to a continuous outcome. In the continuous outcome, I said sample size calculations, sample size is smaller actually. Proportions are much, much harder those are because you need much, much more larger sample size. So here I'm comparing the blood pressure among overweight versus normal weight. Those are the two groups. So meaning my design is comparing means between two groups. So I have taken this article from the New England Journal of Medicine again and lowering blood pressure in black Americans. And they studied 702 patients and I have highlighted they expected 3.0 millimeter mercury, the difference in systolic blood pressure, and they need the standard deviation of the continuous outcome. Standard deviation of the blood pressure is nine. So, so they need those two numbers to calculate the sample size. In this case, the sample size is seven or two, and the power is 80%. So they could, have, they could have calculated 80% to sample size 84. It's not magic numbers, you know. I mean, they may have had access to 702 patients, so they calculate the power, it happened to be 84%. You can go reverse too. Sample size, you calculate the power, you can get the power to the sample size. So in next few slides, I will tell you what you need to calculate power for the continuous outcome. So we need to guess. Remember, it has to be an intelligent guess based on your medical wisdom. The expected be difference between two groups, like what kind of a difference is meaningful, clinically meaningful, is a drop in five units of blood pressure is meaningful. So you need that difference. We also need the standard deviation or variance. We fix the significance level 80% of power. If the difference is smaller, that's what you want to look at, sample size is larger. If the variance is also larger, sample size is larger. Remember, when the variance is larger, the outcome is noisy. Outcome, if the outcome is noisy, it is difficult, the, difficult to um, see the difference between groups. It makes intuitively, it makes sense. So that means if the variance is larger, you need much larger sample size. If variance is very tight, you know, then you need smaller sample size. So, the, so this is what you need for the, um, the study. So for example, uh, this is uh, among NIDDM patients with uh, um, hypoglycemic drug, two oral drugs. And here it is hypothesized. The outcome is hemoglobin, 1% difference, and the standard deviation is 2%. Significance level of 0.05. You can go to that website. You can see 64 subjects to detect 1% difference. If you hypothesize difference larger, 1.5.5, 29 subjects are needed. Okay. I also want to emphasize the end of end of this um, presentation, the 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 first part of the presentation. The, the take importance of taking the baseline measurements. And the, the expect or the here, like here, the, we are looking at the effect of post menopause hormones on level of blood pressure and expected difference is five. Within person variance, diastolic blood pressure is 31, between person variance is 90. Meaning between people, variance is 90, standard deviation is about nine and the within person is 31. 
So you could see between people much larger than the within. So if you, so this is what happens if you take the baseline versus if you don't take the baseline. Without the baseline, you can take 70 subjects per group with 80% power. You can randomize both groups, treatment and placebo, and you can look at the blood pressure. And so this is, that is the study. The second study, you can take the baseline measurements and then you give the treatment and you take another measurement and the other arm also you do the same after the placebo. You could see sample size calculation tells you you need a smaller number. So, so taking baseline measurements, sorry about the typo, is really help. So we went through basically what we need for the, the for example, for a continuous outcome, this, this slide illustrates that, and what we need for uh, the discrete outcome or, or binary outcome that, that you can read these slides and then you can go to those websites and then you will be able to calculate the sample size calculations. So I want to summarize the um, some points here. I think I already talked about these things and the, we do the sample size one for primary outcomes and, and then the, the remember sample size calculations depend on the primary outcome and larger sample size is needed if the outcome is high variability. If the outcome is very high variability, you may want to measure outcome more than one so that you can reduce some noise, noisiness or that, that way you can control the noisiness better, you know, and sample size is adjustment for the power. And there is this John Oliver, he's a British person, but he lives in USA. He's a comedian. He has a really nice uh, YouTube about emphasizing the importance of replications of studies and the sample size. It's a very fun um, video to watch. You can go and watch that video. Okay. So I want to move into the, um, the, the next topic, and as you know, it is really hard to cover something like two, uh, within half an hour um, about these topics. So um, I'm going to give again a very summary of biostatistics, you know, basic biostatistics. So I, I know you, you took a course in medical school and I'm sure you were very busy with many, many other things going on at that time. Felt it was not that important and I can't remember. And so now you had a situation collected the data to a research question and you may have some knowledge of Excel, how to analyze data, but I don't know exactly what I'm doing. So. So just think about what we do in statistics. We do in statistics is we collect data, random sample or some other type of sample, and we summarize the sample, meaning with the mean or proportions, and then we generalize to the population. So that's what we do. Or in other words, we take various forms of statistical inference. So in, sometimes we are interested in estimation meaning we use sampling data to estimate the population parameters, prevalence, risk, odds. And sometimes I already talk about hypothesis testing, like a jury trial, drawing conclusions regarding a specific hypothesis. And using statistical techniques, we also do model development for quantifying the risk associated with various predictors. And and now with the data science and with the development of big data, model development for prediction, particularly with various types of imaging techniques, you know, medical imaging, we are very much interested in developing models for prediction. So, so it is important to translate your questions to the, the um, statistical hypothesis. So like, uh, for example, the, the, is the new treatment effective in reducing blood pressure? You have a hypothesis testing question. What do you report? You report p-values, difference in observed, and et cetera. And if you are interested in the, what is the prevalence of HIV among group users, it is an estimation question. 
you will report point estimation or confidence interval estimation. And then the next question is, is the prevalence is higher than the prevalence of HIV in the general population? In this case, you are doing again hypothesis testing and the p-value and observed difference. And then you are asking a question like, what are the risk factors associated with death due to cardiac disease? You have to develop a statistical model and estimate the coefficients associated with the disease. And can we predict the risk of high depression based on risk factors? Again, for prediction purposes, we need to develop a model. Not only that, if we are doing prediction, we also got to validate the model and see how well it does. Statistical analysis depends on the type of outcome. You got to know what the type of the outcome. Usually when we get data, we first try to summarize the data. That is the first thing. So if the outcome is binary, we summarize the data with proportions. For example, we might say 20% with HIV among drug users. And we construct a 95% confidence interval for proportions. That is descriptively we explain 95% confidence interval is between 10 to 35%. If, the, if your outcome is continuous, if your primary outcome is continuous, you calculate mean, median and standard errors. Like for example, the mean blood pressure among overweight is 92 with standard deviation nine. And we also report the confidence interval 88 to 96. If it is a time to event outcome, we don't report mean because we cannot calculate the mean for everyone. Because in a time to event, like a time to death, not everyone in the sample die. Not everyone in the sample get heart to heart attack if you are measuring time to heart attack. So we report only median time, not the mean time. And then we report couple of minor curves and 95% confidence intervals to the mean. So this is an article um, was published in Lancet 2020 and the by Huang et al, clinical features of patient infected with 2019 coronavirus in China, Wuhan, China. This is an article that was, this is the beginning of the pandemic, January 2nd, 2020. And so this describes the descriptive results of these 41 admitted patients. So 41 admitted patient, median age was 49 years and the the, and then the, the 41 patient had been exposed to the seafood market, right? One family cluster was found. So these are all descriptive statistics. You know, common symptoms were fever. 98% of them had fever. 76% of them have cough, right? So these are all descriptive statistics that they reported. And then they said 41 patients had pneumonia out of all the patients with abnormal finding on chest CT. And then they concluded and they then compared with non-ICU patients, actually here only 15% of the patient died and 32% was admitted to ICU. And compared to non-ICU to ICU patients, they had more the higher level of inflammatory markers, you know, IL-2 and IF and alpha, et cetera. So they use descriptive statistics. If we are comparing two groups, we use te the testing two proportions called chi-squares test. Again, look at the type of the outcome. If it is binary, we go with the chi-squares test. If you are continuous, we are comparing two means, we go with the t-test. If it is a time to event, we compare the two survival functions using a log rank test. And you have seen all these, these two slides. So these are the null hypotheses. And as I said, this is a chi-square test comparing proportions. And this is a t-test comparing the mean. Okay. A common, very popular way of communicating results for a binary, binary outcome is odd ratio. Okay. And actually odds, what is odds? Odds is the proportion divided by one minus p. For example, the people, actually particularly very poor people, at least when I was growing up in Sri Lanka, the people who bet for horses, you know, they use odds. 
they don't say proportion. They use odds, you know, odds for betting. So, so here's, it is easy to talk about odds instead of the proportions. For example, if we think the HIV among drug users is 20%, we can calculate the odds of having HIV among drug users, 20 divided by 80, like 20%. The probability of HIV is among healthy subject is 1%, odds is 1 to 9, 11%. Odd ratio is the basically different ratio between these two odds, 25% to 11%. Odd ratio, that is 2.2. If the odd ratio is 1, that means the risk is the same. If the odd ratio is greater than 1, away from, away from 1, that means the one group's odds, having HIV in drug users is, is two times the odds of HIV having in healthy subject, meaning the odds is very high compared in a, among, for drug users compared to the healthy users, okay? And come similar to the odd ratio, if the outcome is time to event, hazard ratio is defined. So, Sometimes we do interventions, like for example, in this case, and you do the statistical test, and then, then you say, I'm not sure whether the new intention really works because more healthier subjects are in the treatment group. And this is called confounding, meaning the relationship between the treatment and the outcome is intervened by another confounder. So this is an example, evaluation of a new rehabilitation program for stroke. I had 20 people on the, on the program and 20 people without the program. The outcome is how long subject can work. And then we can, we can do the t-test and we find statistical significance. But then we notice more healthier subjects underwent the new program intervention. Meaning the group difference may be due to healthy effect not because they can walk better now, not because of the new program, maybe because they were healthy to begin with. That means we need adjustment for confounding variables such as healthiness, gender, type of stroke, etc. So when we have to make a confounding effect, meaning we are interested in the relationship between treatment and outcome, but confounder is in between. Cholesterol can influence heart attack, but something like body mass index can influence the level of cholesterol as well as the heart attack. So how can we determine the relationship between the cholesterol and the heart attack? So we want to control for the confounder. So how do we control for the confounders? Again, depends on the outcome. If it is a binary, remember binary outcome, we report odds. So in this case, we use something called logistic regression. And if it is a continuous outcome, we do multiple linear regression and we report regression coefficient. In binary outcome, we report odd ratios. If it is a time to outcome, we use proportional hazard model. We, mod we report hazard ratios and relative risk. So I um, took this example from Lancet, Lancet Regional Health Europe region. And so this example, they were investigating how specific factors are associated with COVID-19 mortality as compared to mortality from causes other than COVID-19. Because there is this controversy, okay, people, sure we have lots of people dying in COVID-19, but also as the old age, people are dying from other causes too. So they did this study and looking at the factors. So, so in this case, obviously there are a lot of confounding factors. So, so they use the, the proportional hazard regression to control for co the, the um, control for the confounding. So they concluded many factors associated with COVID-19 were similarly associated with non-COVID death but the magnitude of association differed. For example, old age was more associated with COVID-19 death. You could see how huge the odd ratios are, 40 and 20. 
we usually consider odd ratio of two is high, but just think about 40 and 20, they are huge odd ratio. That means the effect of COVID is very, very huge on, in terms of mortality. And they are comparing 80 years old to the medium age, the, the mid-level age, 50 to 60, basically. So compared to these two groups, odds are very, very high for the older group for dying COVID. But dying from other causes is like about 29. And then they also found out that the odds of um, white people dying for COVID death is actually is the here non-white group had higher odds, meaning minorities like blacks and South Asians had higher odds compared to the whites the, for the, the uh, COVID death. But for the non-COVID death, actually blacks and Asians have lower. And actually this is not the case in United States. In the United States, black people have always the worst outcomes compared to the white people. Okay, so I want, want to conclude this session with some remarks. The first point I want to say is the data-driven decisions will better inform about the treatments and care. So promoting clinical research is, is critical and understanding research is critical so that you can implement treatment and uh, interventions and their limitations. So, so this is a very important and, uh, point I want to make. The second thing is well-planned studies like to yield true findings. If you don't plan your study, if you don't uh, have the sample size calculated, if you don't collect the data well, and the, then it is very likely you are not going to get the truth that you are looking for. And replication of studies are necessary. One study is not going to give you a final answer. Similar studies are needed to conduct and different ethnic groups and different countries and so on and so forth to get a better idea of what is happening. I also want to make up this point. I have been working with human research last 20 years. Research with human subject is very hard. It needs huge effort and commitment from researchers, particularly commitment and it needs Teamwork, appreciable teamwork. Everybody's contributions needs to be recognized equally. Expertise needs to be recognized e equally. If you are not a team member, if you are not willing to do the teamwork and appreciate others' work, you cannot really push your research agenda. It is really, really important to appreciate the teamwork and work with people. Then only you will get the quality, well quality data and then only you can make proper conclusions. And of course, resources is a one huge thing. Resources is, is a very much needed, you know. The last point is patients are resources. We need to be very respectful for patients as well as their rights. And patients are not things that people can just use. So they have their own rights and their contributions needs to be recognized and the studies needs to be approved for human subject research. And I appreciate the work you do in Sri Lanka and particularly during this really difficult time with the pandemic. And every time I go to the um, Emory Clinic, Emory University Hospital, this this one is on the wall at the front entrance and was written by Francis Peabody. Um, Dr. Peabody has written several essays. I'm not sure, that sure whether you are aware. Dr. Peabody has done research in polio and typhoid in uh, 1800s and 1920 or something. And he has written several essays. And this says, one of the essential qualities of the clinician is interest in humanity. For the secret of the care of the patient is in caring for the patient. Thank you. And if you have questions, I can entertain those questions. Thank you so much, Madam, for joining us at this time of the day. It's not suitable for you. But uh, it, it was very helpful. I'm sure the doctors, the young doctors and young researchers 
will benefit a lot from your presentation. I'll, uh, if you don't mind the time, I will just fo uh, focus on a few questions. Yeah, Could I'll be happy please? to answer. Yeah, I can, st I can stay and answer questions. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Could you please give your view on using G Power software for calculation of sample size? Yes, um, there are many software out there. There are some of them you have to buy, some of them are available free. I, in my lecture notes, I gave you a free one. And um, most of the software give you uh, approximate numbers. Remember, sample sizes are not magic numbers. They are approximate numbers. If one website says 20, other some website says 18, that, that really doesn't matter. Um, the larger the sample size is better. So, so if, if 18 and 20, that means, you know, you may want to take about 20 subjects, you know. So, so, so I'm sure G power is perfectly fine, you know, and the, and the soft SAS so, software such as SAS also, uh, you can calculate power, you know. Uh, another question, madam, how do we get the expected difference? Okay, so that's a very good question. How do we get the expected difference? I said in parentheses, medical wisdom, you know. So meaning, um, the, the basically, let's say the, um, the, the, you are studying about stroke, you know. So you probably have, a, you have been treating patients in stroke and you have written, read the articles in strokes. And so you may have a pretty good idea. Um, like, uh, let's say you, you are talking about a new rehab rehabilitation program you want to see, and you may have a pretty good idea about what is happening at the baseline, you know. So, so first you want to kind of get what is the baseline response rate? What is the baseline response rate? And that you, you, you look at the articles and similar patients group and you can get an idea. And then you can hypothesize, okay, I like to get a 10% improvement or 5% improvement compared to the baseline. Okay, like for example, one of the example I gave is lockout, you know, the, um, the, the, with the COVID, you know. So basically, let's say we have, we think like a 30% people are COVID positive during this time. So, um, so we are recommending uh, the people to stay at home. So we can, we can expect it to go down. So 30% to what, you know. So, so you can hypothesize if, if we can get to 10%, that would be great. If I can estimate accurately 30% to 10%, that would be great because then I am saving so many lives. So, so that way, that is how you think about the difference, you know. Uh, one last question. Meaning, meaning, let me say that a clinically meaningful difference. Mm -hmm. So they are asking uh, to repeat the website you mentioned in your presentation, but anyway, your presentation will be shared in YouTube, so they will be able to get it. Then uh, one more, one last question, madam. What are the suitable sample size calculation formulas we can use in clinical research? Can we use Lavanga and Lemeshaw formula for clinical research? Yes, I mean, again, as I said, um, remember what I would say is you don't want to make use many complicated formulas because you can look at the articles like a New England Journal of Medicine and Lancet and, and many medical recognized journals. If you look at the sample size calculations that I illustrated in my slides, they have very simple way of calculating. For, if it is a proportion, only two expected di difference. In it. So you don't need to come up with really complicated formula to calculate sample size. The idea is complicated formulas might give you an approximate number, but that's not the major point. The major point is if the simple calculation would provide you a number, and that number may be slightly bigger than the, the all the complicated problems comes, but that's okay. That because the bigger the sample size is better, you know. So describing a very simple manner, the way I put it in the uh, slides is, 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 is that what you want to do, you know. Again, I would highly recommend you to read certain good articles and then you can look at how they calculate the sample size calculations in those articles, you know. 
Thank you so much, madam. Just one comment. Uh, there are uh, one participant is appreciating your example on the legal, uh, you know, background. Great example. Thank you, madam. Okay, yeah. with that, uh, we, we have come to the end of your session. Thank you so much, madam. It was very informative and very useful for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And again, thank you for the invitation. And, and I was really happy to contribute to it.